Thank you all for coming. Um, I, you know, I, I, you're probably wondering about the kilt. Um, you may not know, today at LinuxCon was actually traditional dress day, uh, and apparently it wasn't publicized very well, so it's just me and a couple of my colleagues wearing kilts. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to be giving an introduction to OpenStack. And uh, OpenStack is, uh, you know, like many open source projects, it's several things. It's software. It's also a community. In our case, it's also a uh, nonprofit foundation. And I'm going to be talking about all of those things. If you're looking for something that's more in-depth Technically, you might want to attend a different talk because this is a fairly high-level introduction to OpenStack. Um, in, my, in my day job, I work at Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat is one of the vendors that's involved in the OpenStack project. And uh, I work on the community side. So I, I do a lot of events, and I do meetups, and I uh, um, give talks. And so my knowledge of OpenStack uh, is, is very broad and a little bit shallow. It is a huge topic. So covering all of that in 50 minutes is going to be a challenge. Um, I've also been involved in open source in general for about 20 years at the Apache Software Foundation. So uh, looking at OpenStack is kind of cool from that perspective because it looks very different from the sorts of communities that we worked on 20 years ago. Um, OpenStack is... As I said, it's a nonprofit foundation, it's a software project, it's a community, and it is only six years old. So it started six years ago in the very traditional way that open source projects start. There were a couple companies that were interested in solving very specific problems. And these two companies, these two organizations, were Rackspace and NASA. And uh, NASA had this problem where they were taking photographs and individual photographs were going to take several months to upload to their uh, AWS instances because these photographs were terabytes and petabytes big, pictures of space from the Hubble Space Telescope. Rackspace, on the other hand, was uh, running a very successful web hosting and also VM hosting business. And they were looking for a way to automate the process of creating new VMs without actually having to have engineers go press buttons. And these two organizations were speaking to one another at, a, at some conference and realized that they were solving similar and overlapping problems, and they started the OpenStack project. Um, six years on, we've grown a lot. We've got over 600 companies involved. We have... Uh, nearly 55,000 community members at this point, and that's people that are contributing either code or community-related things or documentation, a, a wide variety of things that people are contributing. We have, um, uh, well, you know, all of these exciting numbers that you can see on, on the chart there, and I can't see in the squinty font on my screen. But... Uh, the software itself has grown as well. So if, if you uh, attend any OpenStack uh, session in your entire life, you'll see this diagram, which is wholly inaccurate. And it represents what OpenStack used to look like six years ago. Um, there's, there's three major components to OpenStack. There's compute, which is where your VMs actually run. There is networking as a service. And there's your storage. And then there's a web dashboard that that allows you to manage all of this. Now, when OpenStack started, there were, in fact, these three major components and the web interface, and that was it. This is what's in OpenStack now. Um, each one of these items is a optional component of OpenStack that you might be running if you're running a cloud. There's 57 of these projects, and uh, there's also numerous downstream projects, like my own project, RDO, we're a packaging project, and we're not featured on this list here because we're not part of the, uh, not part of the, what's called the big tent, which I'll talk about in a moment. There's also the foundation. And like many open source foundations, it exists for uh, a number of reasons. 
And to me, at least, the most important one of these is vendor-neutral governance. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But uh, the foundation, we also provide a number of other services, including infrastructure support, where if you want to test your project, we have a place where you can do that. Um, we have a, an entire community team. We have uh, user group assistance, which is sort of part of the community team, so that if you want to have a local meetup group, we have support for that in terms of either sending you swag or money or just helping you know how to do things. And then we also have a biannual event called OpenStack Summit. Um, and, and of course, there are, there are many, many companies that are involved in this. This is just a uh, random screenshot from the list of sponsors, but uh, there are 600 sponsors that participate at various levels um, financially and also various levels technically. Sponsorship, if, if your company is interested in being involved in OpenStack, there are sponsorship opportunities to buy a membership into the foundation, ranging all the way from 25K through 500K per year. However, um, membership as an individual is free because it's an open source project. Um, so if you want to contribute to OpenStack in any way, you, uh, you go to the, the website and you sign up as a member of the OpenStack Foundation and now you're a member. Um, the reason that you might want to do this is that all authentication against any services in OpenStack are, are done against the membership database. So if you want to contribute a patch, you have to sign up as a member first because that's how, that's how the GitHub account stuff works. <clears throat> now, going back a few points, um, vendor neutral governance is very important in open source projects. Um, this is also something that we feel very strongly about at the Apache Software Foundation, which is the other, the other half of my life, my off, off work life. Um, vendor neutral governance ensures that everyone's voice is equal. Now, in my day job, I work at Red Hat, and we are one of the four or five largest companies that's involved in, in OpenStack. And um, it's very important to the small players that we don't just force our opinion on everybody. And with, with the vendor neutral governance that, that is offered, that is enforced by the uh, foundation, it ensures that everybody has a, an equal voice. Now, you know, realistically, you know that since we have uh, 40 or 50 engineers that are working on something, we, we tend to have a louder voice. But uh, what we find in the OpenStack community is that people really respect this need for vendor neutral governance. Um, it, it also ensures project sustainability. And this is, this is an important thing in any major open source project. If HP or Red Hat or Mirantis were suddenly to lose interest in the OpenStack project, it wouldn't go away. If uh, IBM were to lose interest in participating in Linux, Linux would not go away. And so this kind of project sustainability is really important. This diversity, corporate diversity within a project is, is critical. Um, it also ensures that projects themselves are not dependent on a particular vendor's opinions. And it does actually work in real life because the engineers that are involved in OpenStack are really passionate about open source. It's been a really rewarding project to work on. Um, the, the projects themselves make their own technical decisions. So I mentioned that there's 57 projects. Those projects operate semi-autonomously. Now, they have, to, uh, they, they have to submit to the judgment of the technical committee because interoperability between projects is, is obviously pretty important. But uh, the, the technical decisions, the roadmaps that are, that are embarked on by these projects are, um, are decided at the project level rather than at the foundation level. Um, OpenStack uh, provides open governance for these projects. And uh, each project elects a, what's called a project technical lead. Now, um, 
The, uh, the project technical lead, their actual role, and I appear to have misspelled leadership, um, the, the, the actual role of that varies a little bit from project to project. In most projects, decision making is completely collaborative and done on the mailing list. In some projects, the technical lead does take more of a benevolent dictator sort of role, but that's becoming less common as we move along and as the projects mature. Projects that are part of OpenStack are said to be in the big tent. And um, projects sort of come to the table and they say, we want to be part of OpenStack. And there's kind of a minimal vetting process where you determine whether a project supports the OpenStack mission. And here's the OpenStack mission. Those of you uh, who have actually used OpenStack know that the simple to implement part there is uh, something we're still working on. Um, OpenStack is, is still quite complicated. And, and projects must be open. Now, open has a number of different definitions. And uh, I want to talk about these because these are relevant to pretty much any open source project that operates in a collaborative way. The first one of these is open code. And that's kind of a minimum for open source software, that the code be publicly available, that people are um, both allowed and enabled to submit changes that, that influence the direction of the project. Another step is open governance. And I've already kind of mentioned this a little bit. This is that uh, the project is, the, the project elects its own leadership and that those leaders are subject to the will of the community rather than the other way around. Everything that's within OpenStack is under the Apache license. And that is a requirement for any project that comes into the foundation, that if they have any components that are not distributable under the Apache license, that they fix that. So this is, uh, it, it, it's not, it's not a big challenge because most OpenStack projects are born within the foundation rather than coming in from outside. But there have been some cases where there needed to be some rewrites to adhere to the license. Open discussion. All discussion must happen in a public and open forum. And if you have a private conversation at a conference, that has to be taken back to the mailing list. This is incredibly critical for projects that span time zones and span languages and span nations. Because if you have a conversation on IRC, that's limited to one particular time zone, one particular language. But when you take that back to the mailing list, it gives people an opportunity to participate uh, even though they were asleep when the conversation happened, it gives the opportunity for translation to occur and for people to express their opinion on a topic. Another aspect of open is open API. Because there's so many of these projects, it's mandatory that each project have an open API that other projects can communicate with. All of the communication between these different uh, parts of the stack is over this over this uh, REST API. And uh, because each one of these projects might be running on one or many separate machines, it's important that this communication happen across the network. And so that is a requirement of OpenStack projects. But the most important one of these is the collaborative software development model um, where, where governance is open. Now, OpenStack, the software, is uh, it's software that allows you to spin up your own private cloud in your own data center. Um, as such, it, uh, it has to have the, the three components that I mentioned on the first slide. The other components are much more optional. And I'll, I'll show you a few of those. Um, I showed you this, this mission statement before. Um, so here this is again, uh, the, the OpenStack cloud computing platform, which is simple to implement and massively scalable. How many of you are actually already deploying OpenStack in, in an organization? Okay, very few of you. So those, those of you know that the uh, simple to implement is still a bit of a lie, but uh, we're working on it. <laughs> um, 
Now, of course, you're, you're probably familiar with the other players in this field. I don't need to dwell on that a lot. AWS is, of course, the, uh, the biggest player in this field. And uh, then we have some other, some other projects. Oh, uh, CloudStack is at the Apache Software Foundation. That is a, um, another project that is simpler to spin up a cloud with, um, but it hasn't gotten quite the, uh, the market penetration that, that uh, OpenStack has just yet. So on the software side, here are what I would call the required components of OpenStack. Um, there is the, the web dashboard. That's Horizon. That's the, uh, the web interface where you can actually interact with, with the cloud and, and do um, administration of your, of your virtual machines, of your, your network, and so on. Keystone is the authentication layer. Nova is compute. That's where your VMs actually run, and this manages the life cycle of the virtual machines. Neutron is, is the networking as a service, and Swift is the storage component. And then there's everything else. Uh, we have a, a database as a service. We have a container service. We have uh, Solometer, which is the um, monitoring and logging component. The, uh, let's see, what else have we got? There is a, uh, a message queue service, and there's, there's a couple packaging projects. There is a, a couple uh, test suite projects. Most of, the, uh, most of the code is in Python. Almost all of it at this point is in Python. We've had a couple projects come to the foundation with existing code in other languages, and a lot of that has been re-implemented in Python. Um, this uh, gives a, a fairly easy entry to a lot, of, a lot of people that have some experience in, in any programming language that, that is similar to this, because Python is fairly easy to learn. And uh, we have a... Uh, one of our projects is the Activity Project. Activity.openstack.org tracks all aspects of the project so far as contributions, um, ticket open and close times, uh, people acquiring the software and deploying it reports back to that. So we, we know about how many people are out there running the cloud um, and the, the reviews and so forth. And so they've got extensive statistical information about the OpenStack community on this website. Now, if you're running OpenStack, um, one, of the, uh, one of the things you might be concerned about is support. And we offer a great deal of community-based support. Uh, there are, there are, uh, th there's one main IRC channel, which is extremely noisy and that is hash OpenStack. But then each project, each sub-project, has their own independent IRC channel. So if you go to OpenStack-Nova on the Freenode IRC network, there will be discussion of development of Nova as well as the ability to ask questions and get support from the people that are developing it. So very active IRC community. IRC is the main way that projects tend to communicate. But like I said, when there is discussion on the IRC channel, that is then taken back to the mailing list for a more permanent record and the ability for people to participate who weren't there. We have a, a uh, Stack Overflow-like website. It's using um, AskBot is the, the open source software that that's running on, and that is called ask.openstack.org. Um, there are hundreds of questions asked there every day. And uh, the, the last time I ran some statistics on it, we tend to have about 75% of the questions answered within the first day. So it's a very active forum. People, people from many organizations participate here. It's a great place to get support. Now, there are two mailing lists. And for a project this large, that's a bit of a surprise to some people. Um, we made the decision early on not to split the mailing list into individual projects. 
So all of those 57 projects participate on the OpenStack dev mailing list, and they put their project name in a tag in the subject line. So you can see everything and not miss out on new projects you haven't heard of yet. But also, if you want, you can filter just the project that you're interested in. Uh, so that, that gets uh, pretty noisy. The OpenStack list is more about administrative details of the foundation. There are other projects, there are other lists. There's a community mailing list. There is a uh, marketing mailing list. There's a documentation mailing list. But for the most part, the code-based discussion is all on that, that one single OpenStack dev mailing list. Um, we produce two events every year, one in North America and one elsewhere in the world. And the one that's elsewhere tends to alternate between Europe and Asia. So uh, in October, we will be holding OpenStack Summit in Barcelona. And in May, we'll be holding it in Boston in the United States. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, uh, the, our, our meetup assistance list, where we have, uh, we, we have both uh, making speakers available to local meetup groups. If you, want to, if you want to run a local meetup on OpenStack, but you don't have any speakers, you can look at groups.openstack.org and try to arrange for a speaker to come to your location. And there's, uh, there's travel assistance money from the foundation to make that happen if you don't have your own budget. So this is a pretty, pretty cool program. Now, a little bit about the projects that are part of OpenStack. I am not going to talk about all of them, because that would take all day. But I'm going to talk about the, the most important ones. So the first one of these is Keystone. Um, Keystone is the identity services, in other words, the authentication piece of OpenStack. And uh, the, the, uh, the folks in the Keystone project are really cool to talk to because they, they are so uh, adamant that things just work. And this is because if anything breaks in Keystone, everything breaks. So if you look at the, uh, at the OpenStack ticket tracker, you'll see many hundreds of tickets opened every day against Keystone. And typically, one of the Keystone developers will look at that ticket and they'll say, this isn't actually a problem with Keystone. You're just seeing it as an authentication problem because something's broken behind it, and it reflects as an authentication failure. So it's, uh, it's a very slow-moving project because they're very careful about changes. One of the design principles of OpenStack is to uh, let you reuse what you already have within your organization. And so Keystone is one of the places you first see this. If you're already running Active Directory within your organization, you don't want to spin up a new authentication thing to run OpenStack. And so Keystone will plug into your Active Directory service or your uh, OpenLDAP or whatever authentication service you're running. If it's not too weird, um, Keystone will have some sort of way to plug into that to uh, provide authentication for your cloud. Yeah. The next piece is Glance. <clears throat> Glance is where your VM images live. So if you're going to spin up a, a, a cloud instance, spin up a virtual machine, you fetch your VM image from Glance. Um, here also, it's important that we interoperate with all sorts of other things. You might know that there's uh, a bunch of different VM image formats. Glance supports all of them. And so whatever image you happen to have, if you've been running on AWS and you want to move to OpenStack, for example, you take a snapshot of your AWS instance, you stick it on your OpenStack server, and it just works. And the same is true of pretty much all of the other cloud providers that you might have been using. If you want to try out OpenStack, you can use your existing cloud images. This is what the interface looks like. Uh, that's a little bit squinty, but uh, you have your, uh, your images listed on the left-hand side there and some basic information about them. And then over on the right, you can edit an image or take a snapshot or launch that image 
or launch 100 copies of that image or whatever it is that you want to do from this interface from the uh, web UI. On the various tables there, you have a command line cheat sheet. And that's because in addition to the web interface, everything is accessible through both the API and through a command line interface. So if you go to any one of the nodes in your OpenStack cloud and you type some of these commands, you could administer your, your OpenStack server in a more uh, command line friendly interface, or you can script it so that you can automate all of this, which is the way that most people actually run OpenStack clouds. Most people are not clicking the web interface every time they want to launch a VM. It's automated. <clears throat> all right, then we have Nova. And this is, uh, this is the largest part of OpenStack. It's, uh, it's the one that's been around the longest. This is the portion of OpenStack that was, that was donated originally by Rackspace. And uh, if, if you look at the statistics, it's also the one that has the most development activity of any of the projects. And this is where people from many of the vendors here at this conference are putting in their particular uh, drivers, their particular functionality, so that you can access their services on your OpenStack cloud. Neutron is the networking component of OpenStack. And uh, this tends to be the place where people have the most difficulty in OpenStack. If you follow the, the various question forums, you find that a, a significant portion, like almost half of the questions that get asked about OpenStack are about networking. And so this is a part of OpenStack that is being worked on very hard to make it easier. However, networking is, is something that, that people spend a lot of time training to do. It's not something that can ever be made trivial, but uh, we are trying to make it easier to do the networking portion of your OpenStack cloud. The other, the other portion of Neutron is the security portion. And so this is firewall as a service. You create your security rules and your, um, your ingress and egress rules. And this can be uh, per instance or globally or whatever. This, this gives you a very fine-grained control over your firewall in your OpenStack cloud. Now, there's a number of different uh, storage projects. This is just three of them. There are others for uh, various other cases that people might want to do. But the main three projects at the moment are Cinder for block storage, Swift for object storage, and a fairly new project, it's only about a year old, Manila, for a uh, shared file system across all of your uh, tenants. And then finally, finally of the required components, is Horizon. Every one of the projects, like I said, must provide an open API. And every time a new project comes on board and matures, the Horizon team provide a web interface for that particular component. So any component of OpenStack can be managed through the web interface. Um, it can also be managed from the CLI. And then there's also a project called Heat, uh, which allows you to do orchestration where you, uh, for example, if some of your virtual machines reach 75% CPU, Heat will automatically spin up more VMs to take that load or take them down when your CPU goes under, say, 25% or whatever. You know, do, do automated scripting to uh, manage your load. Now, that's just a small portion of what's available in OpenStack. So as you can imagine, installing and deploying can be a bit of a nightmare. Trying to get all of the various pieces to talk to one another is very difficult. And this is a space where uh, there's still a lot of competition as to what will be the default deployment mechanism for this. So there's a number of projects that are out there that, that 
allow you to install and deploy and orchestrate and manage your OpenStack cloud. So here's a few of them. The one that is part of, this is the one that's been around the longest. It's called DevStack. And in order to deploy an OpenStack cloud, you uh, clone a Git repository and you run a shell script and that spins up your OpenStack cloud. This is primarily for developers. It, it, it deploys the, the bleeding edge trunk and this is what most of the developers use to spin up their own private test cloud where they're gonna hack on the code and, and try that out. Now you can deploy in production with DevStack. Um, a lot of people do. You can give it all manner of command line flags to deploy rather than trunk to deploy a particular branch, a particular tag, so that you can have a stable cloud. And this is the way a lot of people will deploy their production clouds. Another project, uh, this is my day job, RDO, which stands for Riches Distribution of OpenStack. Okay, it doesn't really. It stands for uh, the RPM Distribution of OpenStack. Um, and uh, this is a, it's, it's a couple things. It's a packaging project. We package RPMs for CentOS and RHEL. Um, we also provide a deployment tool called PackStack, which allows you to spin up an OpenStack cloud um, that is based on Puppet. The, the command line that I have here on the slide, PackStack all-in-one, allows you to spin up an OpenStack cloud on a single node. Now, you're not gonna do that in production, obviously, but I'm running OpenStack on my laptop here using the all-in-one, and it performs absolutely terribly because it's not designed to run on a single machine. But uh, you, again, as with DevStack, there's a variety of, of command line flags to deploy on two or 100 or 1,000 machines. The, uh, the group at CERN, the Center for Nuclear Research in Switzerland, they use RDO on all of their machines. They're one of the largest OpenStack clouds in the world. Um, so we like to, to brag on them. Another way to deploy OpenStack is fuel. And this is, I, I should mention that RDO is, is primarily, originally a Red Hat project. And uh, I do work for Red Hat in my day job, so that's my disclosure there. Um, Fuel is, is primarily backed by another organization called Mirantis. And if you've been around OpenStack for any time, you'll probably hear about Mirantis. They're, they're another company that provides support and services, as well as a very large development team that works on OpenStack. So Fuel is a, a, a great way to deploy OpenStack and also manage it once you have deployed it. So add new nodes, um, add storage, and uh, generally manage your cloud. Mirantis also offers uh, paid support for their, for their services. They're great friends of ours. Um, the Ubuntu Cloud Archive is a way to deploy, obviously, on Ubuntu and Debian. And much like RDO, this is a package repository and a variety of deployment scripts based on Puppet. I don't know a whole lot about the Ubuntu Cloud Archive, so kind of sparse on details here. Now, there's also a project in the upstream called Triple O. Um, this is a deployment and management utility. It, uh, it deploys a tiny OpenStack cloud on a single node, which is then used to manage your production OpenStack cloud. Uh, it makes a lot of sense once you try it. When we first talk to people about it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that you would run OpenStack on top of OpenStack, but it does actually work really well in reality. So that's, uh, that's an upstream that's an upstream project in, in OpenStack, the foundation. So uh, one question that we get, of course, is why are there so many ways to deploy OpenStack? And it's because OpenStack is complicated. There's no one 
one canonical way that you're going to run OpenStack. Uh, you may be running across five or six machines in a small organization. You may be a place like CERN where they've got 100,000 nodes that they're running OpenStack on, and those are going to need different ways of deployment. And so these various utilities have grown up out of that reality. Triple O, um, for a while we thought that maybe this would be the one to unify these approaches. That's probably not going to happen now. Um, Fuel is also an upstream project, and it's, it's taking a different approach. So we'll see in a few years what, uh, what emerges. There are also, of course, various commercial vendors that are willing to do your support for you, to do your installation for you. My organization, Red Hat, is, is of course, one of those. Um, others include Mirantis and HP and uh, Dell and a variety of other companies out there that provide support, services, training around OpenStack. So you have somebody to call when things break. And uh, yeah, deployment is hard. Now, another aspect of the OpenStack Foundation is, is testing and uh, continuous integration. Every single time there is a pull request that comes into the OpenStack project, that is put through the paces. Uh, there is an initial test to make sure that your code adheres to our coding standard. And if it doesn't, it gets rejected at that point before it even goes into the test suite. Then it is put into the, the uh, test infrastructure and exercised through a number of different um, uh, test suites. This is managed by a utility called Zool, and it is really impressive to watch this thing work. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the next step is that your code will be inspected by at least two humans. So here's a, an example of a pull request, and you see down below, you'll see success and failure in various tests. Um, and it looks like some of those failed and then maybe reran later. But up at the top, you'll see two names next to code review where two people actually looked at the code and verified that it, uh, that it was the right thing to do. Now there's an additional social constraint on top of this where um, if I submit a pull request, it is frowned upon for two Red Hat employees to review and approve that patch. So there's the additional social constraint that it ensures that one company does not necessarily have the opportunity to push their views through the community, but uh, you have to have it reviewed by somebody from another organization. Tempest is the OpenStack project that writes all the test suites that are run in this Zool infrastructure. And uh, they, one of the, the very cool things that's part of, of Tempest as of about three releases ago, three or four releases ago, is that uh, not only does it test your code, but it ensures that an older cloud running before your patch and a cloud running one release ago will be able to upgrade to a version of OpenStack running your patch. Now this is important because upgrading OpenStack until very recently was a huge nightmare. Um, the approved upgrade process was burn it down and start over again, um, which of course you can't, you can't do in production. And the result was that, that many people were running very old versions of OpenStack. These days, when a new version of OpenStack comes out, upgrading from N to N plus one is now not only possible, but it's, it's fairly smooth most of the time. And the other thing is, um, you know, you're running your, your OpenStack cloud across hundreds of servers. Um, you can do a rolling upgrade where you upgrade one service or physical machine or VM or whatever at a time, and it can still talk to itself. There's guaranteed API compatibility between N and N plus one so that you can do a rolling upgrade without breaking everything and not have to do it all in one day. So that's, that's a huge improvement just within the last couple of years. 
Now, this, uh, this is from the, the Zool website. This shows some of the activity that's happening in the test suite. And uh, I don't know why that image is so small. But what you can see there is that there are about 600 test nodes running most of the time. Um, there are 1,200 jobs being launched every hour. Um, we're typically running about 1,000 virtual machines spinning up and down in the test suite at any given time. We, uh, I think 15,000 virtual machines a day or something like that is, is what we run through this test suite, ensuring you know, the upgrade and the, the, uh, the patches actually work and compatibility between the different parts of your stack. <clears throat> There's a number of different ways to get involved in OpenStack. There is, of course, contributing code, which happens on GitHub. There is answering and asking and reviewing technical questions on ask.openstack. There are meetup groups, and there is a documentation project that attempts to document all of this. We do have a six-month release cycle, so the docs project is extremely active <laughs> trying to document all this stuff before it becomes obsolete. Now, you all are at an open source conference. You know how important it is to participate in open source. Um, it, it's not entirely altruistic. It's also fixing your own problems and ensuring that the things that you have fixed will remain fixed in future versions. So open source participation is not really something that I need to, to tell you a whole lot about. But uh, one question that, that I get asked frequently is why companies are involved in this. We're working with some of our our, uh, we, Red Hat, we're working with some of our harshest competitors on a day-by-day -day -day basis writing code together. And uh, the, the primary reason for this is that we recognized that our customers want stable cloud platforms, and we recognize that we're not big enough to develop this by ourselves in a short enough time period to make our customers happy. And so we're working with 600 companies to make this happen which means that we have to compete on something other than the code quality. Because our product is just upstream OpenStack. We're not, we're not putting special sauce in there. It's just upstream OpenStack. And so we have to compete on our expertise and our quality of support. Um, one of the principles of the OpenStack Foundation, and this is, this is pretty cool because I'm an open source enthusiast before I'm a Red Hat enthusiast. In order to call your product OpenStack, it has to be OpenStack. You can't put proprietary bits in it. And so when you see the OpenStack logo on a vendor's OpenStack distribution, you know that that's actually upstream OpenStack without a bunch of modifications. And that also means that if you're running Mirantis OpenStack and next year you decide to switch over to HP OpenStack, it's gonna be an easy transition because it's the same thing. And that requires us as organizations to compete on other things like our quality of service and our, our knowledge. So, you know, Red Hat, we, uh, we participate in open source because we firmly believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. You probably heard Jim say that this morning in his keynote. Um, we believe that participating in open source benefits us along with everyone else. And, uh, we also don't want to maintain out-of-tree patches because then you have to do that again the next time. Um, and and we, we believe that companies that don't participate in the upstream won't end up with the same expertise that we have. So I'm not trying to do a sales pitch here. This is the same thing that the HP folks and the Marantis folks and everyone else say of why they participate in OpenStack. So, um, We'll be in Barcelona in a few months. The OpenStack Summit is two things. It is a, uh, a place where vendors show what it is that they're offering built on top of OpenStack. But it's also the design summit where the various engineers from the projects come together to decide what we're doing in the next revision. And uh, we have on-site, in-person meetings where we discuss the roadmap and decide which features are we're going to try to implement 
in the next version. There's typically a mid-cycle mid meeting. Those are happening right about now. We're about halfway through the, uh, the cycle, and those meetings are happening now where people say, well, this is what we tried to get done. Here's what's realistic that we're actually going to get done and, and uh, you know, readjust those expectations. Um, so Barcelona, then Boston, and then Sydney next year. The, the, uh, each release of OpenStack, you may have heard some of the names of the releases of OpenStack. If you've been around the community for a while, they are named alphabetically and each release is named after something about the place where we had the last summit. So the most recent release was Mitaka, which was the region of Tokyo where we had the, the last uh, OpenStack summit. The upcoming release is called Newton, which is a tiny town just outside of Austin where we had the, the most recent OpenStack summit in North America. And then the one after that is called Okata, which is apparently a town near Barcelona. I'm not really sure where that is, but I hope to visit it in October. If you want to try OpenStack, thank you. If you want to try OpenStack without the pain of installing it, trystack.org, and that's also on that, that card that's on your table. TriStack is a service run by the OpenStack Foundation where you can use a public OpenStack cloud for free, uh, spin up several instances, play with the firewall rules. Everything that you do goes away after 24 hours. That's how we, how we manage our utilization. And uh, I am out of time. If anybody has questions, um, please speak up. My slides are available at that URL there at the bottom there. Um, and I can't see you because of the lights, but if you have questions, anyone? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, I will be at the Red Hat booth. I, I do see one question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I didn't quite hear that. Um, yeah, that would be fine. I'll be at the Red Hat booth, but uh, you know, OpenStack is is being used in so the the biggest industry that's using OpenStack right now is is IT. It's it's uh, people providing cloud services for for major organizations spinning up VMs. Another another cool place where we see a lot of OpenStack use is actually the entertainment business. We see a lot of people using OpenStack for render farms for digital films. And that's, that's like number three on the list. Number two is, is research. Um, uh, organiza uh, government and educational organizations using it for research. I just was at University of Kentucky in the United States where they're using OpenStack to provide virtual machines for students. And so at the beginning of the semester, you're issued a virtual machine. And then at the end of the semester, it goes away. They also use it for, for medical research at the, at the University of Kentucky uh, Medical Center. So those, those are the top three, um, just kind of general IT services, research, and the entertainment business, surprisingly. All right, well, I am out of time. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, if you have any further questions, come to the Red Hat booth. <laughs>